I am Joyita Gupta, and this is The Pulse. People with disabilities have always been there. In public places, in schools, workplaces, and at home. You wouldn't think it. Historically, it seemed that people with disabilities were hidden away. They were either homebound or segregated in institutions. Who can forget the now infamous ugly laws designed to keep people with disabilities out of sight and out of mind in public places? However, if one digs just a little deeper and starts to track down the objects of daily living used by people with disabilities, it's possible to uncover a rich history. People with disabilities worked, fell in love, and even ran for political office. Through crutches, pictures, and other historical artifacts, we can glean the irrepressible history of people with disabilities. Today, we discuss disability history. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI-audio. I'm Juvita Gupta and I'm coming to you from the Accessible Media Studios in Toronto. I'm wearing a a crew neck sweater with a round neck, long sleeves, my hair's up in a bun and the sweater is um, Matthew McGurk, my videographer described it as a light purple, like a spring purple. So it's another shade of purple, Um, quite fond of that color and I wear it quite a lot as you can probably tell if you listen or watch this channel on a regular basis. I came across a really fascinating person that I just had to talk to. Nicole Belolin is a a number of things. She's a scholar, writer, researcher, a public historian who investigates the material history of disability and also an independent consultant. And I was really eager to have Nicole on the program to talk about some of her work and some of her interests. Nicole, hello and welcome to the program. I'm so pleased you could join us today. Thanks, Joita. It's great to be here. I described you as a public historian. Uh, what exactly is a public historian? And I didn't realize there were types of historians. So what do you do as a public historian? Thanks for asking. Public historians typically are defined as historians who do work outside the classroom setting or outside the academy, I think is a better way to put it. So public historians work in museums as curators and educators. They work in fundraising. Public historians can work in libraries. Public historians uh, work at federally funded parks, uh, all those places where we're interfacing with the public in regular way. Oh, that's very interesting. And when you're in these sort of public facing roles discussing history, how many inquiries do you get about disability history? Well, it's funny, you know, lots of people don't think a lot about disability history. And so they only start asking me about it once I tell them, you know, what I do for a living and that the conversation gets started. So it's not necessarily something I automatically get a lot of questions about. And yet you got thinking about something that people don't have a lot of questions about. What set you on this path thinking about disability history? It was not something that I anticipated, that's for sure. I did a master's degree at a museum called the Winnish Group Museum, and the degree is associated with the University of Delaware. And that particular master's program focuses on using objects, so everything from the furniture in your house to entire landscapes, to understand history, how people um, developed a family, how people... Uh, did their work using physical things, uh, the history of enslavement through objects. So there are all sorts of uh, really interesting things you can learn about history through things. And so objects or material culture, to use the more jargony word, is one example of a primary source document that historians use to interpret history. And so primary sources are those things that people made in the time period you're talking about. Uh, And so in this program, in one of the first research projects I worked on, I studied something called a closed stool. Have you ever heard of what what those are? They are often fancy, but not always, pieces of furniture that uh, before we had indoor plumbing, people wouldn't put 
put inside their bedrooms and use as a toilet at night. They would often put um, bedpans inside the clothes stool. And so people who might have had a little less money might have just used the bedpan or the chamber pot. But people with a little more money could dress it up and hide it like a piece of furniture, like a chest of course. So I was researching this object and I was really fascinated by the fact that it did not look like a toilet and started to do more digging and started to look for mentions of these closed stools in diaries of people from the time period. And one particular diarist from Philadelphia, Elizabeth Drinker, she lived in the uh, mid to late 18th century and early 19th century. She wrote a lot about using the closed stool in times of illness. And so that's the first time I started thinking about the relationship between objects and what people did when they were ill or possibly disabled at home. Then I did another research project about a woman who lived in the mid to late mid 19th century in Philadelphia who was chronically ill most of her life. And she used needlework to stay in touch with friends and family. So those two big research projects got me thinking about or asking questions like what objects that people use in early America to live with disability. And what time period in American history are you looking at? Uh, like how far back do you go? How contemporary is uh, is your research? I mostly focus on about the years 1700, 1740 to 1840 or so. And so most of the objects that I study were made using hand tools. They were made in a pre-industrial setting. They were made before Americans developed a medicalized uh, assistive device industry. This is really interesting because, you know, we have these different models of disability. Now everyone talks about the social model of disability. And uh, before that, you had the ascendance of the medical model of disability. Uh, but it sounds like the period that you're studying, perhaps even the medical model of disability wasn't as prominent as it maybe grew to be in later years. How were people thinking about disabilities in the period that you studied? Like you're saying the 1740s to the 1840s. What sort of ideas did people have about disability? It really varied depending on the person, um, where they lived, their socioeconomic status, their race. But the one thing that really always sticks out for me about this time period and disability, and I should say I focus primarily on physical disability, though that doesn't mean to say there aren't overlaps with other types of disability. But the one thing about this period that is interesting to me is that people with disabilities of all kinds were extremely visible in early American life. So, for example, if you open any historic newspaper from 1750, 1840, 1800, you will read, for example, dozens of advertisements for people who ran away from their enslavers or from people who were there um, if they were indentured to someone. And they often describe what the person looked like. And these descriptions often will mention if they have a disability or if they were using a crutch when they ran away. And so that's just one example of how visible disabled people were in early America. And I think it it's something people don't realize because of what you mentioned in your intro, what came in the mid to late 19th century, institutionalization, ugly laws, limiting people's access to immigration to the United States based on disability. Because of all these things, lots of people today don't realize how integrated disabled people were into everyday life in 18th and early 19th centuries. Yeah, it's it's certainly news for me because, as I said, I'm mostly thinking about institutionalization, segregation, people you know being out of sight, out of mind. Uh, forgive me if this invites speculation on your part, but do you have any idea about when and why we went from seeing people with disabilities being more visible in public life to being sequestered away? It's a it's a complicated answer. Um, and I I'm certainly don't have all the answers, but some of it has to do with what you talked about earlier in terms of the rise of the medical model and impulse related to disability. So that idea that disability isn't something you simply live with and manage, but something that 
you must be cured or that the or that you know you can't have a good life if it's not cured whatever that disability might mean and so a lot of that developed over the 19th century with the professionalization of the medical field so that's only one reason one one response to that question um it's 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 so complex and so interesting and it's great to be a part of a community of historians who are researching all these these aspects of disability history. Mm, no, it, it, look, I didn't expect you to have all the answers, and you certainly got more of an answer than I can offer to the question, so I'll take it. Uh, one of the things that I've often pondered, because, you know, I, as a part of my, my role on this show, read a, a number of disability memoirs, and I bring those authors on, and we talk about their journey and their experience and why they chose to write their, their memoir when they did, in looking at artifacts going back to that period in history, you say that people with disabilities were really visible back then. But do we also hear their voice? Do we have letters and other surviving documents that give us a glimpse into the interior life of people with disabilities in that time period? Absolutely. Um, typically, the written documents um, from folks from this time period, the ones that survive, tend to be from wealthier uh, white men, but still provides really helpful insights into how people felt being disabled. And one example of that would be James Logan. He was the secretary to William Penn. So for your American listeners, they might be more familiar with with that name than perhaps your Canadian listeners. But so he was a, a high a guy high in government in colonial Pennsylvania. Then James Logan, um, in 1728, tripped and fell on a patch of ice outside of Philadelphia. And he sat down to write about it to multiple people. And he did this over the next 30 or 20 or so years that he lived. He wrote about this event um, and said that he became a cripple to use his period terminology, not a word that we would typically use today. And he recounted this story so many times in his papers that, I mean, clearly it became a defining part of his life. And when this happened to James Logan, he wrote about moving a bed to his parlor, his living room. He wrote about how people had to physically move him by putting pieces of fabric or bedding underneath him to, to move him while he was in the very early acute stages of pain. So he's um, one of the people I've studied who lacked the most, the most written documentation about his experience with physical disability. And of course, then we have to fill in the blanks about how he might have used his family, his friends, uh, servants, perhaps enslaved servants, to help him get around the house. And so his experience is a good example of one of a person of a, a higher social status, but certainly one that gives us some insight into what it was like to be physically disabled in this time. But also, I want to add that he you know, used writing in particular to stay in touch with his friends and acquaintances, like the way the woman I studied who did the needlework, you know, 100 years later, how she touch with folks. So I think it's really easy to think about people as being shut away. But really, again, um, even if James Logan was at home a lot, he was still very much a part of his business circles, his intellectual circles. Mm -hmm. Do you think the visibility that we see for people with disabilities in that time period has to do with the fact that there was an expectation that people with disabilities were, were also going to be uh, contributing members of society? Uh, that they had responsibilities to their families, to work, to bring home an income. And maybe in later years, you see uh, the rise of the reform movement and the fact that people with disabilities had to be cosseted and looked after and weren't really perceived as able to contribute in the same way um, to society or to their families. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, a fun example of that is another guy I studied named... Um, John Lukens, who was the surveyor general of Pennsylvania in the mid to late 18th century. And he had gout, which is a disabling form of arthritis, 
Then late in life, he ordered a very fancy carriage from a carriage maker down the street, and he specifically ordered one that would be roomy and low slung to the ground so that it was more accessible for him. And I really think that this carriage was his way of doing exactly what you just said, making sure that despite his infirmities, he was out and about in Philadelphia in a very stylish, uh, stylish carriage. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, no, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. It's an example of of adaptation or accommodation before maybe those words became part and parcel of 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 of, of common parlance. Uh, one of the things that I, I was looking over your website, and you you talk about uh, Dr. Gruper, who uh, published or tried to have published the account of uh, a woman writing letters from prison. Uh, I'm really glossing over the details. I'm sure you can fill it in for us. But he had an absolutely nightmarish time trying to get this account published because nobody felt that there was value in it, historic significance in publishing the lives and accounts of people with disabilities. Is that something that you run up against as well as someone who focuses on disability history, still having to convince authors and publishers and uh, editors that there's historic significance? Or even you, you said you work in museums, uh, you know, talking to curators and, and others in the museum setting about the value of including disability history. Yes. Unfortunately, this continues to come up in a variety of, of settings, whether it's a publication setting or uh, you know, museum setting. But unless somebody grew up with a disability or has a disability or knows someone with a disability, it's not, it's something that a lot of people, I think, unfortunately, are still afraid of, or it's something that they just don't know how to, to talk about. And I certainly probably wouldn't know how to talk about disability, except that I happen to fall into this, this research interest. Um, so because of that, I, I spend a lot of time advocating for disabled people using my research on disabled people in early America. So I do a lot of workshops where I say, look how visible disabled people were in early America. And it's a lot longer than this, but therefore <laughs> make sure you are making your museums, your libraries accessible for disabled people today. You read my mind. That's actually going to be my next question. I mean, what is the value of disability history research to fighting ableism today? And do you think that there's value uh, other than sort of advocating to make spaces barrier free and inclusive? Do you think there's value for people with disabilities knowing their own history as well? Absolutely. I would think so. I mean, I don't identify as disabled myself, but as as a woman, for example, I, I learned a lot about the history of of women from historians and find that to be really helpful. Um, and also, you know, disability, as you know, affects everyone at some point, and it affects with other parts of our identity, whether that's gender or class or race. And I just feel very strongly that it's uh, something we all need to have at least a working vocabulary um, to talk about. Mm. Um in, in terms of our earlier conversation, I briefly want to touch on this because you, you talked about how in describing slaves who ran away, uh, the advertisements in papers would often reference their disability. So that's one connection. But what other connections exist between the disability history that you study and, and slavery, which was, uh, which was very much intact at that time? Uh, so much. Um... I'm not an expert on the history of slavery. Many of my colleagues have written wonderful books on this topic. Uh, but for example, in some cases, uh, an enslaved person's disability might affect their monetary value on the market. It would affect what types of jobs they might be doing for the people who owned them. Um, it could affect their family life. I mean, it just sort of goes on and on. It was a huge, huge part of of how the history of enslavement unfolded. Uh, you allow me a, a, a little bit of a, if you'll allow me to say this, I think one of the coolest things about talking to you is uh, realizing that you, in fact, collect artifacts as well. So you're not just talking about them and researching them, but you also collect artifacts. Tell me a little bit about uh, your collection. And uh, maybe if you have a couple of artifacts to share with us, that would be really amazing to see as well. Certainly, yeah. I started collecting 
sh- shortly after I took my PhD exams, I my I was looking on eBay and saw some historic photographs of people posing with crutches, and I th- and they were at a price point that I could afford, so I started buying them. So I have dozens of photographs of people with disabilities. Um, and I have a couple here that I can share with you. I also have a big collection of crutches. I have a crutch here I can share also. Um, but let me bring up, uh, let's see. I can show you. This is a, a late 18th century tin type. So it's a small photograph of a woman and two children dressed in plaid dresses. They, they're coordinated. And one of the girls at her feet has a crutch. And it looks just like the typical family photograph. And there are are dozens of these, not only in my collection, but in other museum collections in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, Here's another photograph from about the same time period of three men, one of whom has a crutch and one of whom has, looks like one, amputated arm the three guys i think two are seated one is standing and so i mean i have many more examples of this but this is one example of something that i collect and as i said i also collect lots of crutches and this one that i'm showing here is wooden and the interesting thing about it is that it has a bunch of little engravings in it these engravings are people's initials and I don't know for sure why there are initials in this crutch. Uh, there is a crutch at uh, the Connecticut River Museum in Essex, Connecticut, that has a bunch of people's names on it. And they wrote what kind of injury they had and on what date. And I think it was used in a shipyard setting and kind of like part of a first aid kit that people must have just used when they needed it. So this So this crutch that I have could have been used in that way also. I'm not entirely sure. But um, the interesting thing is that when I buy things like crutches at antique shops, people, when I bring them to the register, I think because, again, we're not accustomed to talking about disability, they often say things like, oh, this, this looks like a spooky medical thing or something along those lines. And so I, depending on how my day is going, I try to them a little bit more about how they're you know really ordinary objects that lots of people use historically and today for acute and and chronic reasons so just a small selection of stuff i have but i i like to use them in those workshops i do to get people thinking more concretely about what disability is today what it was historically that is so cool. So a number of these objects come from eBay, which I would never have guessed, although I suppose you can buy anything off of eBay now. But of course, there are also antique shops, Nicole. By any chance, did you ever get around to finding out how many objects you have in your collection? I probably have dozens of photographs. I have maybe 12 or so crutches. I have a painting of a man in a wheelchair. I have a small uh, vernacular style, so sort of... Um, uh, locally made chair, to, local to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, with wheels on it, with a little footrest for a leg that may have been made for a person of short stature, may have been made for a child. Uh, we'll never know, probably. <laughs> that was public historian Nicole Bolalin. That's all the time we have for today, but I hope if you're interested in some more of Nicole's research, writing, and if you want to check out her collection of historical objects relating to disability history, I hope you'll head on over to her website. It's been a pleasure speaking to you about disability history. If you have any feedback for us, you can write to us at feedback at ami.ca. Find us on Twitter at AMI Audio. Use the hashtag PulseAMI. Or you can give me a, give us a call at 1-866-509-4545. That's 1-866-509-4545. Don't forget to leave your permission to play your voicemail on the program. I should mention, if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at Juwita Gupta. This week, our videographer has been Matthew McGurk. Ryan Delahanty is the coordinator for podcasts at AMI-audio. Marga Flalo is our technical producer. Andy Frank is the manager of AMI-audio. And I've been your host, Chuita Gupta. <laughs>
Thanks for listening.